Today's video is sponsored by Skillshare, an online learning community for creators with thousands of classes in design, entrepreneurship, music, writing, lifestyle, fine art, basically anything that you can think of. Last time I recommended the Stand Out and Make Money on YouTube course by fellow YouTuber Jazza, but if that wasn't your cup of tea, then this time I'm going to recommend the interior design course Styling Your Space with Emily Henderson. It's important to like spaces where you spend all your time, whether it be at work or at home, and I'm personally using this course as inspiration so I can finally start decorating the apartment that I moved into six months ago. Skillshare is giving away a free two-month unlimited access trial to all of my viewers who click the link down below. After that, it's only about 10 bucks a month for as many classes as you like. If you want to support my channel while also fueling your creativity and maybe even your career, then definitely give Skillshare a try. And with that said, on to the show. Was there ever a show that you watched as a child that left you absolutely traumatized? Perhaps it was a movie that gave you recurring nightmares for several years. Was there ever a seemingly normal and child-friendly TV show that you trusted that all of a sudden produced something that was terrifying to watch? Well, welcome to the club, because I've got a video full of this bullshit. So my good buddy Adam, over at the YouTube channel Your Movie Sucks, recently completed his series on childhood trauma, in which he talked about movies or TV shows that haunted him when he was young. It's really good, and you should check it out. Everyone tells stories about movies or TV shows that really traumatize them as children, and things that stick with them as adults. <laughs> Okay, so first off, this is the type of video that could honestly go on for hours if I don't keep myself in check, so I'm just gonna get to the point. People have always asked me to cover urban legends and myths, but I always saw the subject as terribly overdone. The only way I'd be able to approach this is by talking about ones that I personally grew up with, ones that probably scared the crap out of me as a child. So Hawaii, I'm from there. But I'm sure most of you already knew that since I can't really go on for more than two days without mentioning it. Am I homesick? Yes. But we're not here to talk about that. Back on topic. Menehune. Let me say that again. Menehune. In Hawaii, they're basically these gnome-like creatures that are rumored to live sort of away from human contact. Up in the mountains, valleys, caves, you name it. Now, admittedly, young me didn't really find these guys very scary, especially considering they're oftentimes cheerful depictions as mascots in other marketing. And here's the thing. An uncle of mine shared the same sentiment in his younger days, and he had a tendency to mock the more superstitious folk amongst his circle. He was so cocky that one day he decided, hey, let me drive my truck up to that cave that everyone says belongs to the Menehune, and how ridiculous this sounds right now, but work with me. And that's exactly what he did. At least according to my family, since this happened years before I was even thought of. Anyway, so as the story goes, my uncle drives up, steps out, heads into the cave, and begins to curse the Menehune while a bunch of his friends watch from the entrance. Having seemingly dodged the Menehune's wrath, my uncle gets back into the car only to find that it won't start. And after just a couple turns of the key, the thing snaps. A shitty day indeed he was having, again according to the story. There's every chance that this was completely fabricated to freak me out as a child, and to be honest it kind of worked. Either way, the point is we're generally taught back home not to mess with things like that, no matter how harmless they may seem. We're especially not encouraged to enter a place that doesn't belong to us and disrespect its inhabitants. So I suppose maybe that was supposed to be the moral of the story. Like I said, before that, I'd envisioned these creatures as being kind of goofy, completely incapable of doing any harm, and suddenly Suddenly, I'm being told that they basically have magical powers and can curse you. Yeah. No. Speaking of curses, I'm sure that you've all heard of Pele's curse, whether it be from your recent Hawaiian vacation or due to the Kim Kardashian makeup incident. Madame Pele, for those of you who don't know, is said back home to be the goddess of volcanoes and fire, which also happens to make her the de facto deity of creation, since the islands would not exist without her help. As any local will tell you, however, Pele gives and takes just as lava destroys and creates. What I'm basically trying to say is that if you believe in Madame Pele, you know not to piss her off, and you especially know not to steal from her. Why? Because those who do are generally said to suffer particularly bad luck or severe illness, so much so that hundreds each year believe they fall victim to Pele's curse, and as atonement, mail back whatever object it was they stole. As you probably guessed, a family member of mine actually did this once after visiting the volcanoes, which by the way are all the way over here. My family's here. We don't all live like five minutes away from a volcano in Hawaii. Anyway, my grandmother supposedly pocketed a lava rock or something like that, and she fell ill very shortly after, prompting her to mail the stone back. 
Again, this is one of those before I existed stories and my family kind of likes to goof on me, so let's just pretend that they're telling the truth here. Here's the thing though, this particular Pele myth isn't the one that scares me. There's also a segment of people who believe that the goddess is capable of manifesting in human form, either as a younger, beautiful version of herself or one that's old and hag-like. Duality is kind of her thing after all. Pretty much every culture has their version of the mysterious specter appearing on the side of the road at night looking to hitch a ride, and for us in Hawaii that mysterious wanderer would be Pele. So why did this creep me out as a kid and stick with me? Well, Pele is generally said to be seen around the Nu'uanu slash Pali areas, which are outside the main city. Imagine the stereotypical imagery of Hawaii, the mountains, the greenery, the hikes, but at night. The islands can go from gorgeous to shit your pants scary really quick. Imagine driving in a place like this alone at night. By the way, there really aren't any street lamps, and then you see an ominous woman in a dress just standing there. A worse version of this is the one where your car stalls and the woman begins to walk towards you. It's said back home that you should never bring pork with you when driving around the Pali area, which sounds ridiculous, but here's why. It's said that Pele was once in a relationship with another deity, Kamapua'a, a sort of half-man, half-pig that's not terrifying at all. Needless to say, things didn't exactly work out for the two, and as such, pork kind of pisses Pele off, it's a whole thing. Your best bet here is to either get rid of the pork or feed it to the woman's dog, said to be present in differing versions of the story. Once you do one of these, your car should start up again and you'll be free to leave. But here's the problem. You're still in Nuwanu. Aside from a run-in with Madame Pele, you may encounter night marchers if you're dumb enough to be hiking at night, or you may find yourself at Morgan's Corner, a place famous for being exceptionally tragic and haunted. If not any of those, then you might just find yourself parked at the Pali Lookout, the site of a historic battle to establish the Hawaiian Kingdom that involved hundreds of Oahu warriors jumping or being pushed to their deaths by the soon-to-be king. The Kasha House This is one that I actually talked about ages ago, but this was like back when no one watched my channel, so allow me to reiterate. The Kasha, or Kaimuki House, is probably the best-known supposedly haunted house on the island of Oahu. Why? Because the police were involved, more than once, even. But what's Kasha and what's Kaimuki? Kaimuki is simply the town in which the house is located. Kasha is a bit more complicated. So really quickly, Hawaii is a melting pot. A lot of people tend not to know this, but the state actually has an Asian majority, and white people are the minority. How did this happen? In a nutshell, a long time ago, Hawaii began to get into the sugarcane business and needed workers, and soon enough, boatloads of immigrants from the Philippines, Japan, China, Korea, etc. showed up. They all mixed with the local Hawaiian population, and the culture evolved accordingly. This is where the Kasha name can be explained, since the term is meant to refer to a supernatural being in Japanese mythology, a yokai resembling a demonic cat that's said to steal corpses. But how did this place earn a name like the Kasha House? Honestly, this could last an entire video, so I'm going to keep this short, but the answer is because the house has been experienced by many different people spanning several decades, again, some of which were police officers who went on record in local newspapers. One such story tells us of an officer called over to the house, which at the time was shared by a handful of female roommates. It was late at night, and the girls claimed to have been hearing strange noises. One even claimed that she was grabbed on the arm by someone, but no one in the house could figure out who. The officer deemed it best for the girls to leave the house for the night, and while on the road to escort them somewhere else, the girls' car pulled over. One of them was in a complete state of panic for seemingly no reason, acting as if she was fighting someone off. The officer tried to intervene, but before he could calm her down, he was shocked to both see and feel what he called a big, strong, calloused hand that couldn't possibly belong to a teenage girl that suddenly twisted his arm, prompting him to radio for backup. Like I said, this isn't the only documented story surrounding the Kasha house. The other stories include murder, bodies being buried on the property, and a separate occurrence in the 1940s of a family that was again being attacked by unseen forces. I'm not sure how or why the story ended up in the newspaper, but it and many others only add to the myths surrounding this place. Now, before you go looking, I'll just add that the house was demolished a couple years ago, bringing a decades-old tale to a close. But despite the house no longer existing, its legacy definitely lives on. It's just one of many Obake stories, as my family called them, that exist in my homeland. Obake, a term originating from Japan but in Hawaiian pidgin, has gone on to simply mean ghost. 
So I thought it would be fitting to close out this video with a few stories that are as close to home as you can get. Stories that supposedly revolve around my family home in Hawaii, which would be where my Japanese side resides. As many of you know, I am also part Filipino and I did spend a chunk of my life growing up in the Philippines with my father. So I'd like to save those stories for another video since I have a lot to say. So as you can expect, the stories that scared me the most were ones that directly had an impact on my young life. I was told that my family home was haunted. It's an old house. A very old house, built by my great-grandparents after their arrival from Japan. As you can imagine, old houses always sport a good amount of lore. The place is completely wooden, creaky, and Japanese, which made it creepier. My great-grandma actually passed away in the house, peacefully of course. This was about a year before I was born. Stories about little kids communicating with deceased relatives has always scared the shit out of me. You know the stories where, like, a kid recognizes a picture of grandma despite never having met her, those sorts of things? After my great-grandmother died, strange things began happening at the family home, and needless to say, these stories made me lose a ton of sleep. So there was this one time where my older cousin, a very young child at the time, was playing alone in the yard surrounding our home. According to my mom, they'd noticed that she was talking to someone. Someone who wasn't there. When asked about it, she told the adults in our family that she's been talking to Grandma, the one who was no longer with us. Now, on top of this, with my mom supposedly smelling my great-grandmother's perfume every so often, and my great-aunt claiming to have seen apparitions within the house, yeah, I, I had problems. That was some nightmare fuel. Another one that really bugged me was a story revolving around my aforementioned Menehune angering uncle and his soon-to-be wife, now my aunt. As the story goes, she'd been visiting one day and decided to use our bathroom. A couple of minutes later, she ran out screaming and hyperventilating. Why? Well, you see, our bathroom is weird. It's kind of this long, narrow thing with two sections. The toilet is in its own area, separated from the sink. Showers completely in another room. Anyway, my aunt claimed to have seen a little girl peeking in at her through the window, which freaked her out so much because this bathroom was on the second floor. There was literally no way that this could have been possible. This bathroom, by the way, I believe I mentioned this in the first video, sat at the end of a long, freaky, usually dark hallway. Of course, I'm not claiming that anything that I mention in this video is actually real. They're all just stories, and while, as I said, I tend to be skeptical, stories like this always get to me, especially if I first heard about them at a young age. As mentioned earlier, I definitely do have more to say on this topic, and I'd love to talk more about my experiences growing up in the Philippines in the next installment. Let me know via Twitter if you have any questions for that video. Thank you all so much for watching, and a huge shout out to my Patreon supporters, specifically these people. Joel, Matt, Mark, Stefan, Justin, Julian, Avocadros, Shelby, Spooky Q, VHS Squid, Garth, Jay, Shadow, Danielle, and Ursula. You guys are the absolute best, and I'll see you all again soon.